I'm happy to present this um, recital of music of Josef Haydn on the three instruments that he was well acquainted with and played during his lifetime. So the um, first uh, clavichord, which is um, um, this particular clavichord is a very large later 18th century instrument, but uh, Haydn uh, in his early days, after he left the choir school, he was in 17 at that point, and he lived in an attic apartment, and he said he had a, this old worm-eaten clavichord, which really brought him joy. Uh, it would have been a much smaller instrument, such as uh, what I have in the other corner there. But by the late 18th, later 18th century, the larger clavichords uh, were being uh, built more often, uh, with the, the full five octave compass, and also they were unfretted, which means you had more um, more ability to move and do uh, as much legato as you want, for instance, more singing lines, um, and that kind of thing, which really worked with the music that was being um, that was being proposed at that time. Um, Haydn did play clavichord throughout his life. And I believe the clavichord really provides the basis of actually all 18th century keyboard composers. Their technique was based on the clavichord because most of them had the clavichord at home. Many of them couldn't afford a large harpsichord, for instance. And so the, the technique and also the musical expression that is possible on a, on a clavichord, I think, became the basis of, of all keyboard music. Uh, it's very, because the tangent stays against the string throughout the keys being depressed, you have, you have total control over that sound, um, like a, just like a violinist, as you draw the bow. And also, um, you, really, you, you really control the tone. And on the clavichord, um, the performers is in much, much more control of the sound, or producing the actual tone uh, to a much greater extent than on the harpsichord or a forte piano. It's kind of given to you. And that's it's very rewarding, and it just, um, to, but as you hear, it's, you will hear, it's very soft, and so it's more of, a, in a way, a private instrument that um, you would use to sort of console yourself, uh, <laughs> Um, that's one of the one of the uh, traditional um, thoughts about the clavichord. Is it was a personal instrument. This is a instrument I built in 1995, based off the Frida Ricci in the Leipzig Museum. From data from that, because there's no close-up inspection. Um, so it's the Frida Ricci for that. But after a number of years, in 1985, I, I built it specifically for Carol Lay. And uh, time passed, more research came in, more understanding popped up, and we went and tried some different things. The first thing that actually happened overall was with the tangents. Tangents, as all of us did, we bought most of those out. They're hard, hardened modern brass. The pins were hardened modern brass, and so forth, and it turns out that the materials were much softer in those days, and they used, took it to their advantage of what they wanted to do. So these, this first wave, I think, was replacing all the pins of a couple of different sizes with the soft, softer brass. You can imagine two harder metals hitting together are going to sound brighter than two softer metals. And then the strings are also, uh, excuse me, the strings pretty much stayed in place at that point, but then we discovered trying to repair one of the old tangents and it broke, and we had to kneel it and soften it up, and I stuck it back in. And the plane ride home, I realized, why does it sound so much better? It's softer, it's smoother, it's more mellow. Less of a ting at the beginning, I realized from having stuck it in the stove to heat it up to bend it again, it had been annealed. And that was a big difference, because their annealing was not as hard. They, they didn't, they kneeled sooner and they stopped, as opposed to modern things. So the, I came back and we did an annealing job on that, and then we discovered that the modern tangents are much thicker than st standard historical ones in. 
for a reason. Those were filed back laboriously by Carol Lane and so on. And then uh, the Burkett wire for brass was released, and from after the phosphorus iron that he had done very successfully. So we put some of the softer brass. It's a softer brass, but because of the way it's drawn, it's still very strong enough to go along with historical scales. So that's where this one is. It's been moved closer to historical practices of the materials of the strings and the pins and the tangents. And that's pretty much where this has been up to. And you'll hear what difference that makes with Carol Lay's playing next.
And of course, would have known harpsichords as well, especially in his role as a Kapellmeister for, um, well, especially the, the Esterhazys. Uh, the harpsichord was, you know, the the um, the grand instrument of the courts, uh, the royal courts, and in wealthy homes. The the piece I'm playing for the uh, on the harpsichord is an early piece of Haydn's. He likely would have composed it at a clavichord, uh, but when he performed it, perhaps was performed on a harpsichord. The third movement, the Adagio, is especially um, evocative of the clavichord's intimate sound. This is a Zuckerman shop built Stonington French double, built in 2006. And after some time of knowing, which is a continuing on of the changes I discussed earlier, that uh, the strings on this have been replaced with softer, less modern hard strings. These strings are the, the phosphorus iron strings of Stephen Briquette on those, and a softer brass below. The pins have all been also, as on the other one, replaced with the softer brass of different sizes, three or four different sizes to go along with the compass. And the most recent change to this, um, it had been voiced before, but some pieces have been put together as what all these taper jacks and, and other details were all about to discover that there's actually, when you, if you ever play a harp or guitar for any of you, um, there's a very careful way you have to learn how to manipulate that string to release it. And that's in order to make the most full, clear sound without a lot of nastiness to it, perhaps. Well, it turns out the old makers discovered the similar thing. It's still a plucked string, whether it's from the finger or from a fingernail or from a plectrum or a quill or whatever. And that's also a necessary motion. So there's actually what I've now called a jack motion system in at least the last 200 years of harpsichords that were built. There's different ways of approaching it, but... What goes on here is when you actually start to push the note down, this plectra are all tilted up, partially for this reason, there's two, three reasons that work well. 
as it comes up, the very tip of the platform is all it's going to initially touch the string. Okay. But in doing so, since it's angled, it ends up tilting itself forward underneath. Let's see the better one here. You can see a better motion here. It's, it goes forward underneath the string, which means it is actually deeper on the plectrum and will be able to lift longer before it's released. So it comes up, gets very slight here, there's a tilt right there. Comes up, engages, tilts forward and under, starts to lift the string vertically, and then the plectrum curves just slightly, which starts to push the jack away from the string. And the string, at that moment right there, and then just the very tip releases. It very, very much reduces a, a burst of highs upon release, and getting more vertical lift gives you a fuller sound for this. Comes up, tilt, forward, up, slight tilt away, and you're only a very, very tip, so the plectrum doesn't have to be forced past the string to get the release. So it's a much gentler release. As a result of that, you're not having to push so hard with your fingers to get the plectrum to push past the string to release it. Most, most of the pressure of hard actions in, in harpsichords is actually you're having to bend the plectrum. It's not going into lifting the string or moving the string, it's making the plectrum bend enough to get that release. So this greatly makes a much more fluid uh, feel to the, to the keyboard and gives you better, better timbre and so forth and, and a much cleaner initial sound without that burst of highs on each note.
play is a late piece of Haydn, the E flat major piece that was composed in 1789 and 90, which was actually the, uh, the, the same year of the prototype of this forte piano, which was um, the original that it's copied from, uh, was by Louis Dulken of Munich, and it was, um, it was built in 1789. So the, the piece fits exactly in, into this, um, in this, this world of sound. The, um, it's a Viennese, so-called Viennese, action, um, but being built in Munich, uh, Germanic, uh, it's a very big, solid case, and it doesn't have, it doesn't really have a lot of bells and whistles that some of the Vienna, especially, especially later forte pianos had. This has um, just raising of the dampers, it raised, uh, which, which are controlled by knee levers, and um, I really only use it in a couple of sections, uh, sort of big sections for a, a basically a, a change of register. You might think of it that way in the second movement and also in the third movement, but not in the in the first at all. It's not really needed. You've heard a lot of what was done with the clavichord and some of the things the harpsichord also was using softer materials for the wire and the pins. That same thing happened to this Dulkin, 1976 Dulkin, copied by the Wolfs, and the strings were, were changed. The phosphorus iron of Stephen Burkett, the softer but strong iron, was used for this. Mellower tone, and the pins were all replaced. So the pins were pulled out and replaced with more appropriately soft, soft level of uh, hardening that was done historically. And which again, as in all the other ones, it's your string vibrating against something stiffer and brighter or mellower. Uh, and that's all that I did or supervised with on that. And then Carol Lay and Michael discovered that the sound is a little bit too much not agreeable. And they went ahead and then rebalanced it because you changed important things there. And they rebalanced it and did some more leathering. They be led the hammers to mm -hmm. a level. And that's what you'll be hearing next with the honey for that.